Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks again for joining us for our quarterly updates on the markets. I'm joined by Rob Ensland, by now a very familiar face to you. Um, Rob is one of the co-founders of a discretionary fund manager called Strategic Capital. Strategic have been running South African portfolios for Carrick for around about five years now, as well as international portfolios. Exceptional return, but, but exceptional risk management um, alongside that. Uh, really looking forward to today's uh, webinar, Rob. Thanks for your time. Um, for those of you that don't know myself, um, I'm Anthony Palmer, Group Commercial Director for Carrick, also looking after products and investments. So today we're talking about what's transpired over the last three months, where we are currently, and importantly, what the markets are going to do going forward. So Rob, if you can update us on the last three months, please. Absolutely, and thank you, Ant. And before I kick off, just to the listeners, thank you from my side for taking the time to be with us. Really, the, the, the slogan of today's presentation is returning to normal. And I think we can go as far as just recently, the Wimbledon final or even the Euro Cup, and certainly north of the equator in many developed markets, I think it's true to say that it was encouraging uh, to see some familiar sites with full crowds, full capacities, and both from, a, from our personal lives, but from an investment standpoint, those are all encouraging signs. So with that, really just to take us through what has transpired over the last three months and certainly year to date, I think it's fair to say that if we were sitting in January and looking at markets, they've certainly gone on to achieve decent returns for the first six months of this year. Uh, if we look at, for example, the MSCI world, which is representative of developed markets, on a, on a six month basis or year to date, we're up 13%. And I think that's where I'm coming from. It's certainly within the realms of a full year return and certainly satisfying. Um, next down is emerging markets doing 8.7%. So there's certainly a point there to be made um, at the beginning of the year, given relatively more attractive valuations in emerging markets, the weakening of the dollar, um, one would have anticipated or potentially looked at emerging markets as more favorable. I think as this year's got going, what has certainly transpired is this uh, disparity between the haves and have nots. And unfortunately with vaccine rollouts, it does feel like developed markets are ahead of that curve and is partially reflecting itself in those numbers. Uh, another worthwhile point to make is that uh, real estate which really bore the brunt of 2020, with the lockdowns of, of really the global economy. There has been this recovery taking place and certainly I think listed real estate is well aligned to that. So we've seen a, a strong rebound in, in listed real estate, both uh, in, in parts of Europe and the US, but uh, in terms of the year, year to date up 15%. And then lastly, the point I want to make on this slide is that the, probably the, more, the, the, the toughest part of the market has been that fixed in, just fixed income component of the market. We've all kind of trying to gauge what inflation looks like. And as one would know, as high inflation would be a negative outcome for the bond markets, uh, all else equal. So certainly that segment of the market has been challenging uh, and a lot harder to construct a portfolio from. Rob, if, uh, if I may, a couple of things jump out to me here. Uh, number one is the equity returns, you know, 39 odd percent over the last 12 months. I think an important point to make is it is coming off a low base, you know, after the COVID sell off last year. And those certainly uh, we do not expect and the market doesn't expect those types of returns for equities going forward. And then, as you say, those, those, those fixed income returns, you know, difficult environment with very low yields, as well as, you know, the, the the, the movement or inverse movements to interest rates. And we are in a very low interest rate environment. So nice summary of, of you know, what's transpired here to date and over the last quarter, um, what's currently going on? Yeah, so I think that's a good question to pose right up front. Um, certainly, I think the backdrop that we've just gone through has been extremely accommodative for risk assets like equities, listed property. So that's a large part of where that performance has come from over the short period. But I think over the last decade, we've actually had a very accommodative environment. And it is true to say that clients shouldn't be anticipating sort of 30, 40% returns year on year. That would certainly not be in line with our thoughts. Um, but the overall environment, we do think is still quite accommodative for risk assets. But let me unpack that in a little bit more detail. So, so really just to, to, to paint the backdrop of what we're dealing with in markets right now is a very accommodative environment, which I've just mentioned. And that accommodation has come on, to, on from two levels. Firstly, on the fiscal side of the equation, uh, 
Governments around the world have really created fertile grounds for, for asset prices and recoveries. Uh, and probably the best way to sort of measure that in a tangible way is to compare the financial crisis of 2008, 2009 to this time around to give you some sense of the degree of um, fiscal stimulus that has been at play. So if you look at the charts on the left hand side, the US, for example, uh, the amount of stimulus that was applied back in the financial crisis as a percentage of the GDP or GDP, uh, and then you compare that to 2021, you go across the board, you can just see that there's significant uh, support that has been put in place. Um, not to be outdone on the other side of the equation, on the monetary side of things with regards in simple terms, interest rates, but we've actually moved into to quantitative easing. There's been a similar response particularly from the major central banks across the, the board. And just to give you some context to that velocity of money, if we look at the seven biggest central banks in the world and look what they did over the previous quarter ending 2020, they really roughly introduced about $10 trillion worth of stimulus to the market. Fast forward to 2020, the onset of COVID and over the last sort of 15 months, they've introduced a further $10 trillion into the system. So that's a hell of a lot of money finding a small home and you can understand why we've had this strong underpin both from the fiscal and the monetary side for asset prices. Uh, also, I think it's true to say that that really has filtered through to the real economy. And if we just jog our minds back to a year ago in these types of presentations, it was quite, it would have been quite hard to believe that sitting here today, we would be talking about the potential of hiking interest rates in large parts of the economy. And then the charts on the left hand side just gives you a sense collectively of the rebound in global manufacturing that we've witnessed. And the shape and the velocity of it does kind of ring true to a similar period back in 2009 during the financial crisis. So all things told, I certainly think uh, the world has recovered somewhat and is looking a lot healthier than what we would have anticipated and in actual terms today. So really, I think of, of my entire presentation, this is probably the most important slide and it's really come down to the simple million dollar question as I've described it. I think all of us anticipate high inflation from where we've come from as economies reopen and there's a rebound in business activity, the movement of people. But the question is, are we dealing with the potential of higher than we all expecting inflation, uh, sort of that bull case super hot recovery? Or on the flip side of the equation, have we all over anticipated this recovery and this rebound? And that what actually transpires in the next couple of months and years is sort of below par growth with inflation or stagflation type environment. And each of these types of outcomes have very different sort of uh, responsibilities and investment managers of how we allocate capital uh, towards the broad asset classes. So I think this lies at the heart of the debate and, and the truth be told, as information becomes available, the market continues to recalibrate that. And I wouldn't be surprised if we do start seeing more and more volatility in the markets in the next couple of months. I don't necessarily say that is a bad thing, uh, but just as investors in funds, be aware of that increase in volatility over the short periods. So if I really take it then one step forward and I say, well, if I, if I look at the world today and I try and break it into some key themes and then from those themes, take it a step lower into some of the sub themes. I think in our minds as a team, the sort of at the heart of it, it's this debate of reopening on the one side and the offshoot of reopening is the, the effects of inflation. So when I'm looking at reopenings, we're talking about business activity. Where is that picking up? To what extent? Is it ahead of expectations? What segments of the markets are doing well? What isn't doing well? And then certainly that debate on the table between emerging markets and developed markets becomes a very important one. Without jumping ahead, I think it has become quite clear that developed markets have come out of this whole crisis a lot better, whether that's from the amount of uh, support from their governments and their monetary policies that they've been able to implement. And then even with the vaccine rollout, which has been a lot more progressive in developed markets. And that certainly then leads into the whole vaccinations and some of the offshoots that we are now dealing with. The so-called anti-vaxxers not prepared to be vaccinated poses a threat to this whole global herd immunity in itself. And then also what we are seeing is with these fiscal stimulus packages in play, uh, quite a strong backdrop for commodity prices. So we're seeing record prices in certain industrial commodities and how sustainable and how long lived will that be? 
On the other side of the equation, with that very positive backdrop that I've just presented, we have the offshoot or the pressure valve in the sense of inflation. Uh, and at the heart of it, I certainly think the Federal Reserve plays a key role in terms of guiding the globe of direction. And I think they've been left with a very tough call. Uh, they've really been forced to, to some degree, as much as they talk it down, get their timing right of when they're going to start introducing interest rate hikes and equally removing stimulus from this from the financial system, which will then, I think, lead the rest of the world forward. Uh, and I think the debate we're all grappling with right now is the inflation that we're witnessing, is it transitory or is it permanent? And, and I think the last bit of data that has come through in recent months has probably shaken up that very clear transitory view that most of the market has had. But again, I think because information is so fluid, we do need to respond as information comes in. And then some of the other subcategories just to be aware of and we'll touch on is the US dollar. I mean, the US dollar has certainly weakened significantly from the onset of, of stimulus. Have we found a bottom? Uh, equally, because there's this amount of debt out there in the world, one of the ways of paying for that is through higher taxes. Uh, and then just lastly, the, the question that is often uh, raised is, is the market now overly expensive? So we'll touch on valuations briefly. So on the starting off on those themes, just on the debate of inflation fears, um, I think we just need to take a bit of a step back with the, with the longer term lens of the trajectory of inflation globally. And we've had a very accommodative environment in the sense of low inflation for almost three decades now. And I think that's by design. Uh, I think uh, with certain changes with the way um, central banks have managed money, price stability has been at the heart of that process and in very, uh, indirectly that has meant very low inflation regime. So if we take a sort of a 50, 60 year view on inflation, we're not moving into uncharted territory by no means, but certainly over that short period, that 30 year window, this recent pickup of inflation does raise certain concerns. And I think that is at the heart of the debate of whether this is now structural change in, in trend or whether this is a transitory period due to bottlenecks and as economies get going, we'll, we'll sort of return to normal. Um, I've shown this slide a few times in previous presentations, but I think it just does frame the mood of the market. Looking at the Bank of America's global fund manager survey, uh, managers are posed a certain amount of questions. And one of those is to rate the key risk in markets right now. And the first point, which you said before, is that COVID becomes more and more of a rear view mirror risk for financial markets. While certain parts of emerging markets are still grappling with COVID from a pure market forward looking mechanism perspective, uh, COVID certainly doesn't feel, feel like a key risk at the table anymore. What has become a key, a key risk is inflation and the offshoots of that being how the bond market responds. And I just want to point you to the charts on the left. You can see now it is certainly the number one risk, but even compared from April to May, the extent or the, the margin of that risk has, has further increased. And then second to that, the same question was posed with inflation. How many participants consider it to be transitory versus permanent? And the majority of the market, and I would argue ourselves, still think that inflation is likely to be transitory, around 72% of uh, applicants or, or people who participated in this thought it was transitory with only 23% expecting it to be permanent. And that in itself is a risk because we certainly don't want to be one-sided in terms of you and something that we do need to be dynamic enough to respond to. And then just the last point that I have made is that the last data, last bits of data that has come out both from the US, even the UK, does go against this transitory view for now and does re re raise certain questions to that. Rob, if I can interrupt you there, um, <clears throat> inflation is not necessarily a bad thing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, if it is permanent, but at reasonable levels, then you know, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great question because it's a question we have to remind ourselves also from time to time is inflation, as long as it's coupled with really high growth, I don't think it's really a challenge for, for markets per se. It particularly risk assets like equities, the ability to price on that higher inflation is, is certainly possible in, and particularly in the right sectors. Uh, the challenge, I think, is probably in an environment where we see stubborn higher than normal inflation coupled with below average growth. That is a, not a really attractive environment for asset prices. And, and, and if I had to judge it, a much bigger risk um, for, for global markets per se. But we are seeing the growth 
<coughs> at the moment. Yeah. Um, and okay. So for now, we're certainly seeing a rebound in growth. The question is the sustainability of that growth into 2022-2023 it, it lies at the heart of this whole debate. Right, so just staying with that whole inflation um, argument, a very reliable gauge is to look at the Fed's so-called dot plot. So each member of the Fed committee uh, is placed on a dot plot, really representing what their core of, in, of, of interest rate hikes are to be. So you can see in 2021, uh, on, the, on the far left-hand side of the chart, no one anticipating interest rate hikes. And then slowly as time passes, the number of members that expect two, three, four interest rate hikes. And what has become quite clear based on the most recent meeting of the Fed, which took place in June, is that they've turned a lot more hawkish in both their wording and sort of their, um, their numbers compared to the previous meeting. So that was a red flag for markets. And just to give you a sense of that, the median dot plot has shifted to two hikes in 2023 from zero in their March meeting and seven participants expecting that the first hike will happen in 2022. So that is a, a movement in terms of a more hawkish outlook. And then equally, their, their forecasts of inflation have moved up. So previously, they thought inflation would be between 2.1 and 2.2% in their March meeting. They now think for 2021, inflation will be 2.9 to 3%. Um, so Although that is a more aggressive move from the Fed in terms of the outlook, I do think it's a healthy mechanism. Um, I do think that the Fed was finding themselves more and more behind the curve and ultimately forced into a very tough decision. They have given themselves a lot more leeway or flexibility in terms of their decision taking. If inflation does turn out to be more permanent and structural, they've now made that first move and the ability to start hiking without surprising the market would feel a bit easier. And then equally, if it does ultimately become transitory, sort of the language that we've heard from the Fed from a con on an ongoing basis, you know, they've almost created an uh, extra runway for a little bit more accommodative environment. So I think although that created some volatility around June for markets, it was a very smart move from their part. Uh, we took a lot of encouragement from that. If we move on to the next theme, and that is market stimulus, coupled with very low interest rates, we, we, we are seeing uh, major central banks around the world actually injecting money into the financial system in the way of um, bond buying programs, which ultimately creates dollars in the economy or pounds. And if anything, the next move from these central banks will be to start retracting the pace of bond buying that we're seeing in the markets. So for those of you not aware on this call, as it stands right now, the Fed is buying around 120 billion dollars worth of bonds on a monthly basis. So that is a huge amount of stimulus in the system. Uh, the Bank of England are doing the same and to a varying degree, even the ECB. So the question now is with this very um, sort of threat of high inflation, more than likely we'll start seeing a reduction in that bond buying program. And if the financial crisis was anywhere to go by, we could start seeing between 15 and 20 billion a month retracted from that 120, meaning that in about a year's time, that stimulus could be out of the market from a monetary point of view. However, we need to offset that and appreciate that on the fiscal side, there are still big plans um, in play. And certainly the, the idea there is to sort of prolong growth through, through infrastructure bills. So we've recently witnessed after lots of jostling in the US, finally a bill passed of about 715 billion. It was smaller than anticipated, but certainly still a very big number. And it is more symbolic in terms of Biden's administration being able to pass this bill. So this, this initial, initial round was referred to as infrastructure or surface infrastructure spending, the likes of bridge, waterways, will go into the US economy. And I do think that underpins employment quite nicely. Rob, uh, I think uh, in my mind, uh, infrastructure spending, you know, sending people checks in the post, it just is so much more tangible, so much more real, right? I mean, having lived in the US for five years, there's a big, big need for, for upgrading infra infrastructure. Whereas, you know, when you talk about, uh, you know, buying back debt, uh, bonds, you know, that where's that money? How does it flow to the man on the street? Is it sitting at the banks? At bank level, you know, and uh, and so it's for me, it's it's nice to see real tangible stuff, and and you know that's going to create jobs. Those people are going to have more, you know, disposable income, and are going to be consuming. Yeah. So 
if we compare this round of stimulus that, that we've recently going through essentially compared to the financial crisis, a big difference there has been that money has actually made its way directly into the consumer's hand, as you rightly say, through, through checks in the post, whereas in the previous cycle, the, the, the mechanism was really through financial markets, making conditions exceptionally uh, accommodative, which really found its way into asset prices as opposed to the, the more hard hit side of the economy. Uh, equally, whilst America is a powerhouse on the global front, from an infrastructure spend, a large part of the economy is, is, is in terms of infrastructure is really aged. So this is a good initiative in terms of creating a dual role of improving the infrastructure and a long runway for employment. Uh, so yeah, there is a slight difference there compared to the financial crisis and stimulus. If we fast forward on to the dollar, and I certainly think the dollar has been on an interesting trajectory post the financial crisis. Um, you know, we, we've certainly seen originally an anticipation post the financial crisis of a potentially weakening dollar. All that's really not transpired at all for the dollar. We've actually seen a dollar that has strengthened somewhat, all else told, over the last decade. And then on the onset of, of COVID and the amount of relative stimulus that we've witnessed in, the, in this economy, you've certainly seen the dollar weaken over the last 20 months. And that was a very, very much a consensus trade that we were all anticipating for, for the coming sort of year, two years, three years forward. But probably what's caught us all off guard somewhat has been this more hawkish tilt from the Federal Reserve. And all else told, if we see a more aggressive rate hiking cycle from the US than we anticipate, and certainly relative to its developed market peers, we could certainly see some dollar strength from here. And in recent months, the dollar has felt like it has bottomed somewhat. And why this is important is that the dollar remains the reserve currency of the world. It has a huge input into for the likes of emerging markets and commodity prices. We talk about the dollar being an inversely, uh, inversely uh, correlated to emerging markets. So our call in terms of emerging markets would be impacted if we start seeing further dollar strength. Another theme just to be aware of is rising taxes. Um, so recently, back in June, the G7, the, the seven largest uh, or most influential economies in the world got together and, and what was put on the table was to have a standardized corporate tax rate, a minimum uh, corporate tax rate of 15%. That was successfully passed and the idea is that with the G7 uh, taking this on, the rest of the world will follow suit. Since then, we've seen around 130 countries endorsing this standardized um, corporate tax rate. And I do think it has an interesting dynamic at play with regards to certain sectors. More your globally orientated and distributed business models will be impacted by this. So the likes of your technology, for example, who've, which is global representation of, and have found sort of safe or low tax jurisdictions as head office, this, this negatively impacts them. But that being said, this is not new information. This information is now in the price of assets. And we can say that the reaction for the likes of the technology stocks, et cetera, hasn't been as adversely impacted as some of the market participants would have suggested. Market valuations, I think, is an interesting debate. Um, yes, I do think it's fair to say that the market is now looking a little bit more expensive than it was uh, 15 months ago, and certainly a lot more expensive than other periods in its own history. But I just want to raise a few points here. First and foremost, uh, if you're just investing in indices through passive investments, then yes, you're certainly buying that expensive segment of the market. Whereas within those segments or the, the broader market, there are certainly still opportunities uh, to invest in. And we'd like to think some of the active managers that form part of our solutions are actively looking for those opportunities in the markets. And then secondly, if we just look at PEs as the measure of price, it's yes, certainly things look expensive, but we would argue that's quite a blunt instrument to look at markets from. Uh, and, and no better example than would be back to 2010, 2011. Back then the market followed quite a similar trajectory post the financial crisis. I think the markets bottomed in March, 2009. From there, they really just powered on for two years uh, or, or more. 
And at, at that stage, the market started to actually look quite expensive on a PE basis. What we all underestimated was the follow through from there was actually real structural earnings growth that came through. If we look at a PE price divided by earnings, that E divider started becoming more and more meaningful and the markets actually moved to a fair value type um, environment. And if we look at the current markets, uh, it follows quite a similar suit. We are entering earnings season now. So as an investment teams, we are watching those earnings very closely. But what we're hoping to see is sort of a follow through in actual earnings growth of businesses. And really what I'm saying then is the market might not be as expensive as it appears on a rear view mirror PE basis. The vaccine rollout has certainly been a key ingredient towards the winning and losing sort of geographies of the world of late. Um, and unfortunately, I think Africa finds themselves at the, the low end of that equation. If we look at the, the sort of broad geographies of the world and how much of their population has been vaccinated, North America around 71%, Europe around 65%. So the scientists suggest that that's basically herd immunity type numbers that we're talking about. Contrast that to large parts of the emerging markets, none so more than Africa, where we've only seen 3.6% of the population that has been vaccinated. And that creates in itself quite an interesting argument. We spoke about a K-shaped recovery much of last year. We're talking more regards the sectors, the stay at home versus the sort of um, economy facing type segments of the market. That K-shaped recovery feels now between emerging markets and developed markets in our minds. With the offshoot of vaccinations is a segment of the market that is arguing against vaccinations. And whether without forming a, a personal view on that, I think the data is pretty clear. So probably a good case study would be to look at the United Kingdom uh, they tick a few boxes with regards to herd immunity, around 65 to 70% of their population has now been vaccinated. And at the same token, the mobility of people with the economy opening up um, recently, as well as the sort of sporting events that we've just witnessed, uh, they do form a good case study for whether herd immunity has been reached. And whilst they are certainly experiencing a third wave in terms of the Delta variant, the contrasting difference between this third wave compared to the first and the second is the number of hospitalizations and deaths. And up in the first and second waves, there was a very strong correlation between the wave and unfortunate deaths and hospitalizations. There's been a big decoupling in that regard. And that would suggest that this vaccination rollout is certainly bearing the fruits and the benefits for society. And I spoke about that K-shaped recovery two slides back. Um, Pretty clear, tangible way of looking at that is if you compare emerging markets versus developed markets in the charts on the left hand side, uh, developed markets or the MSCI world represented by the blue line versus the white emerging markets. When the developed market side of the equation really got going with their vaccine rollout was in the first half of this year. And you can just see how the markets have decoupled uh, from that sort of period in time. The charts on the right, I just thought it was worth also including, and it's just looking at sort of key countries in terms of population groups that are not prepared to be vaccinated. So where the vaccination is available to them, but by principle, they're not prepared to be vaccinated. And sort of standouts there would be France uh, with the red bar there, as well as parts of North or the United States, where it's a huge drive by the US to try and incentivize uh, their population to be vaccinated because ultimately if you don't reach that sort of tipping point which is suggested to be between 65 and 70 percent then that risk is still present the COVID risk is still present in in society so it is a big hurdle where we we, we haven't even had to face that yet in emerging markets where developed markets have moved in that in that regard I touched on business activity uh, and it has it's very hard to argue against the fact that the world has recovered to some degree. Um, I think it's fair to say that compared to sitting here a year ago, things have probably played out a lot better than we would have anticipated. And that rings true to, to, to the human um, sort of race. I, I think examples there would be uh, back in 2012, I recall in Japan when they witnessed their uh, their disruption through, through um, the earthquakes and the initial thoughts there would take Japan 10, 15 years to recover from that. But human ingenuity and our ability to, to respond is often underestimated. And I think throughout COVID, that has been a clear outcome. 
uh, society has repackaged themselves, learned how to do things differently. And we're certainly not out of the woods with regards to COVID. I think the world faces a big challenge, but it, the point I'm really making is that we've come out of this a lot better than we would have anticipated. And a good way of measuring that is from a from a manufacturing rebound across the world. The economy's engine has started growing. And this kind of does link into that previous slide with regards to inflation. A positive offshoot of this has been commodity prices. And today's debate is not about South Africa, but many of us on this call are South African. And that has certainly been a strong underpin, and I use the word slang, but it saved, saved our bacon, really, uh, in terms of a country, because this commodity prices that have been as strong as they have been, has certainly been a big input into certain emerging markets like South Africa. Uh, the likes of iron ore, copper, have benefited from a global recovery, coupled with infrastructure bills, and then even the drive towards more uh, environmentally friendly type um, technologies which demands commodity, uh, copper for example, certainly benefited many commodity prices that are running red hot at record prices. And then I think you can't really do a, any type of presentation today without the, the argument of ESG investing, standing for environmental, social and governance issues. Uh, COVID, although some of these issues have certainly been around for decades, COVID brought this to the forefront in terms of our thinking, particularly, I think, on the, on the social and the environmental side of things. And really what I'm just showing here is a chart that represents the uptake of ESG principles and in investing five years prior and then over the last five years. And there's been an explosion in that regard. Uh, and I certainly think it is a positive outcome from an investment standpoint that has, has arisen as a, and accelerated as a result of COVID. So yeah, I think really with that, um, I've created a bit of a backdrop. There's certainly, uh, we're not, if I can sum it up, we're not out of the woods per se. There are challenges at the market and there's a lot of unanswered questions that we continue to monitor. None so more than, than inflation, which I think it would be foolish to just try and predict what inflation looks like. We almost need to, as information comes in, respond to it accordingly. But all things told, I think the market's actually looking somewhat uh, on a stronger footing than many of us would have anticipated 12 months on. That being said, uh, we do need to also just take a look at some of the market risk presence at the moment. And I do think it's fair to say these are the types of environment that are very dangerous because we are so focused on what's happened in the past. We're looking in the rearview mirror. We're maybe a little complacent towards new unanswered risks that are maybe forming in front of our eyes as we speak. So in our mind, uh, some of these that we've touched on and then some new, certainly inflation risk is the number one risk we think on the table right now. We score it a four out of five in terms of its velocity. Um, and with that is really the timing of central banks and the Fed, for example, of when do they hike interest rates, how aggressively do they do so. Um, for now, we still think they've got things somewhat under control, but it's one that we're monitoring closely. And if they get their timing wrong, they will certainly have a negative impact towards asset prices. New COVID variants is also something that we have to be watching and monitoring closely. To date, we've witnessed the beta variant and even the delta variant. And while we have it as a three is to date, all the sort of vaccines that are currently available have been able to deal with these new variants. The challenge comes in if we face a variant down the line and all of a sudden the current vaccine technology that we are applying or jabbing is no longer applicable. That would be a, a really huge risk that markets would face. Um, geopolitical crises are, are certainly at the forefront. I mean, given the lack of mobility of people, we would argue that Intel, et cetera, might have been a little bit more challenged over this period. So something we just need to keep an eye on. Cyber attacks has really accelerated in the last six months. We've witnessed it both on a governmental as well as a corporate level where hackers have really gone into institutions demanding some form of crypto payments. And we think that's also an investment opportunity in terms of the theme. So we certainly spend a lot of time in our direct share portfolios, trying to identify some of the leading um, types of industry sectors to, to invest in. Uh, that's an ongoing process. Valuations, um, we've touched on that. You know, we don't want to be complacent towards valuations. It's hard to argue that markets are screaming cheap, but as always, there are pockets of opportunity. We just need to be clear that we are positioning our portfolios in those more fairly priced segments of the market and avoiding those market segments of the market 
that's become overly um, sort of optimistic relative to reality. And then just last two points, again, I'm not really focusing on, a, on the South African side, but for those listening, the vaccine rollout and South Africa's debt crisis are key to, uh, to South Africa's success going forward. So I've already put this all together, and this is certainly the, the last slide of the presentation from a global market outlook point of view, some key points there. Um, we have seen a return to normal, I think more so north of the equator than south of the equator. And a large ingredient to that has been this vaccine rollout. It has, it has been a game changer. And we have said that was likely to be the game changer as things transpired. Uh, we've seen a strong recovery, both in services and manufacturing sectors across the globe. And as I've said a few times, I think the consumers probably ended up in a much stronger position than we would have anticipated um, 12, 15 months ago. And that has actually meant that we've seen saving rates in certain countries a lot higher. And that in, in, all, in, in simple language means that we could see some pent up demand. And as our ability to go back to restaurants, travel, et cetera, transpires, that might be in itself opportunity uh, set for in terms of uh, investing. The sort of offshoot of all of that positive backdrop is inflation. Um, it is an ongoing monitoring assessment, whether that it's transitory or permanent is at the heart of the debate. Uh, as I said, I don't think it's, it's smart to try and pick a lane there, rather let information play out and as it do, does have an investment approach that is flexible and nimble enough to react accordingly. Uh, as it stands right now, our view is that it's still transitory, but we're certainly monitoring that on an ongoing basis. Uh, so from a global market perspective, we've certainly had a strong just all assets performing well over the last 50, 15 months. As this recovery matures, I think we move to a more fragmented type outcome, meaning that a lot more attention needs to go into where are you geographically located in terms of your investments, what sectors are you in, and even what styles have you invested in between growth, value, etc. So that's sort of approach is a lot more measured and needs to be a lot more understood by whoever's making your investment decisions. It's certainly something we pay a lot more attention to. And really, if I had to just sum this whole backdrop out, uh, I think it's a type of environment that requires a lot more sort of hands-on approach towards your investing. But at the same token, we are constructive and we are measured towards risk assets like equities. We certainly don't think we're quite there yet that one needs to be worried <coughs> per se about risk assets. Perfect, Rob. Thank you very much. Um, as always, a very, very concise uh, and, and you, you, you have a knack of simplifying things for us. So, so, so thank you very much for that. Uh, I think overall, a positive, um, a positive uh, description on the markets and what we can expect going forward. <clears throat> um, I like to use an analogy that, that, that uh, you introduced me to where it still feels like the market's pretty much like a tight elastic. And as we get data or information coming in, we are going to see that volatility. Markets are going to react. Um, and we often get asked questions by our clients, you know, um, uh, you know, can we time the markets? Let's hold back um, so, some, some sort of dry powder and opportunities, opportunistically invest. Uh, I would like to say that it's very, very difficult to time the markets. Um, we do keep some dry powder um, for those opportunities. But in general, uh, you know, all of our, all of our investments are long term. These are investments that, uh, <clears throat> that are built to withstand different market cycles. There's a lot of diversification built into the models. Um, and with long-term investments, they uh, generally are buy and hold investments. Um, and, uh, and I think that um, the portfolios have been well put together. Uh, I think we've got a good backdrop of, of where, where the markets are. Um, behind the scenes, as you can imagine, there's a lot of bottom-up work. What Rob spoke about today is that macro top-down. Um, but as to what you actually invest in, um, the, the active versus passive debate, um, that continues. Uh, we are, as, as Carrick, always um, uh, open to having conversations with you. If there's anything from this presentation that you would like um, some more information on, if you'd like discussions around your own portfolios, please reach out to Carrick, reach out to your advisor. Um, Rob is also very happy to, to have uh, one-on-ones. And uh, Rob, thank you for your time. To our listeners, thanks again um, for, for dialing in. And we really do look forward to the next quarterly update. Excellent. Thank you, Anson. Thank you to all the listeners.